on their part, its impact may be disastrous to personnel as well as local public. We know the most tragic incident happened on 3rd December 1984 at Bhopal. Even after decades, it still remains as a painful memory and haunting us. We should be prepared and committed to prevent such incidents in the years to come and should be a role model to the coming generations. Every organization wants to achieve the zero action rate in order to attain the targets and reputation. So all the hidden hazards behind any work has to be communicated very clearly to the person who are directly engaged in the works. Every organization can attain further heights only by following the standard operating procedures and practices very strictly. Today's subject for discussion is process safety, a revisit which is very relevant to the present scenario as almost all industries are trying to recover their past glory in the post-COVID period. Process safety is a term commonly used in the process industries to describe the safety requirements related to design and operation of hazardous processes. I am sure that we should be able to gather much knowledge about process safety from an eminent speaker, Sri Vinay Kumar sir, and it would be better to the participants from various organizations and industries. On behalf of the HSE Forum, I would like to invite Sri Vinay Kumar sir to handle the session. I also welcome Sri Nayar Nandakumar, who is the real driving force behind this event and have taken great effort to give a new face to the HSC4. I extend a warm welcome to Srimadhi Meenu Vijayan and all participants and NSC personnel who are coordinating the event. Thank you. Over to Meenu. Thank you, sir. Now I welcome Vinegoma, sir for uh, taking the webinar. Welcome, sir. Benigoma, sir, can you hear me? Sorry, it's in the mute mode. I can hear you. Yeah. I, yeah. I can hear you, okay. yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you for the kind introduction, uh, Jay Kumar, sir. And uh, thank you for this invite to give a small talk on process safety. Uh, process safety by itself is a uh, you know, vast subject, which you know probably will take days together to, if we go into a, a formal discussion. So we are trying to just compress it into a one-hour lecture with uh, some emphasis to be given on inherently safer design concepts rather than going into the standard. Uh, process design, process safety concepts of, you know, Hazwa, Baza, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to emphasize on the starting of a process. And uh, I do believe that, you know, you don't have to necessarily apply these principles only to a chemical process plan. It is possible with a little bit of effort to apply to any work that is being undertaken Including a construction work, you can apply the principles which are there inherent in process safety and you can get a safer output. That's, that's you know, you can come to, I mean, I think, you know, at, at least I have felt that it is possible to do it across board to whichever job that you are taking it up. Maybe you will be able to appreciate what I'm trying to say towards the end of the uh, uh, lecture. Uh, can I have the next slide? First slide, please. So in this uh, presentation, I am just taking some time off to see some statistics of industrial accidents and some couple of uh, notable accidents. I will not say industrial accidents, though I have written their industrial accidents, just some concepts of process safety. How do you achieve process safety? And the, can these concepts of chemical process safety be incorporated in other industrial areas? And uh, we'll take some time off for some general discussion. I am told I've, I've been given about a time of one hour and 15 minutes. So probably I'll rush through some of the slides without going into details. These are probably the data that you already know, but anyway, we'll go through it. Can I have the next slide, please? This is this is some, some general statistics that work-related accidents. You know, there is a statistics by ILO 
that there are approximately 6300 accidents workplace related accidents which is occurring every day it can be an accident or it can be disease which was surprising i never thought of that there are so many accidents taking place in this world in a workplace and about 2% of the worldwide accident fatalities fatalities occur in india and it looks small but uh, that's about 50000 fatalities in a year occur in india and we do not know what happened to the statistics on <coughs> injuries due to <coughs> accidents at workplace because that is not very clearly spelled out worldwide data or even for that matter india data i could not really get some authentic data on uh, statistics on workplace related injuries uh, can i have next slide please worldwide we all know that construction sector accounts for maximum fatalities which uh, natural fall from height is a regular thing that happens even in non construction related field even working in a process plant we have plenty of accidents where people fall from height or uh, you know you have got moving machinery problems but chemical process industry even though they happen only once in a while the impact of the industry of a chemical process accident is much much larger and sometimes it lasts for long time and it might even carry through generations we hope that such uh, accidents are very few and far between if not zero but uh, there have been incidences where an uh, ill effect carry through generation we have had in kerala also there is an allegation that one of the pesticides used has uh, created uh, um, genetic deformities across generations so such things have been i uh, know they are extremely difficult to understand at the beginning but once it happens it has got devastating effects so because of these effects and you know due to some influences from insurance companies and statutory authorities etc and chemical process plants themselves have got fair amount of money with them so they have been uh, uh, in the forefront of developing safe work practices because the effects are very bad to the society can i have the next slide please so this is just a, a percentage statistics of what has happened in the world in a 17 year period percentage of you know various industrial accidents you can see petrochemicals general chemicals and uh, pesticides together is about 57 57% of all the accidents which happen in the world are related to industrial accidents are related to chemical and similar uh, industries the other other ones are uh, small small percentages from various other uh, industries but the impacts naturally will be higher from these three areas which are there can i have the next slide please and uh, in this chemical plant what is the maximum which is the substance that which created the trouble maximum 40% of it is a hydrocarbon which is light either it's petrol or it is gas or lpg 40% and uh, another 12% comes from natural gas and another 12% comes from hydrogen related and heavy hydrocarbon account for only 11% so mainly it's lighter component which we know that lighter components can create more problems so they don't have to expect that you know that, that is what uh, uh, is likely to create create a problem in this next slide please we'll rush through these slides just we'll spend some time here immediate cause of an accident these are the uh, petrochemicals petroleum uh, petrochemical plus uh, chemicals plus uh, the uh, 57% that we saw 44% of that happened due to equipment failure 19% that happened due to human error 21% happened due to equipment failure plus human error so human error or errors committed by the working personnel seems to be quite high 40% are created by people the involvement of people in a working machinery or a working plant and uh, uh, an ill effect of the way they are uh, carrying out their jobs the environment means you know it could be weather related etc etc so it's written environment that's what it means it's a weather related phenomena you got a very heavy storm or something which happening can i have next slide please 
and where did it end up because of these things that once the accident was over 39% of them required a design change to ensure that a problem doesn't recur again another 22% required a procedure change so which means around 60% 61% could have been prevented had sufficient thought gone into the process of doing these things right at the beginning 61% of the accidents could have probably been prevented just for this and another 21% happened due to i mean another 21% required a change in the inspection practices which is uh, normally what we do during shutdown all the chemical people process people would know what uh, uh, is being done in a process plant during an inspection Uh, during a shutdown time next please next please uh, this is another study uh, i think we'll skip this it doesn't matter i think the point is made as to what are the major causes we'll skip this slide please when did these accidents occur 50% nearly occurred due during normal operation very important where people are least expecting it even though we say that startup and shutdown times are the most dangerous ones the statistics show that 50% of the accidents in the world in chemical plants occur during normal operation and another 18% due to chemical transfer which is understandable there will be some system which is not functioning properly uh, during a chemical transfer some there will be a leak or there will be something else that's happening there may be a contamination issue something like that and then that creates big trouble during an operation time if 12 percent happened during maintenance work which is also what we have seen during our working life that maintenance have you know there are issues related to maintenance activity activity because it is usually very intense a job that is going on so there are likelihood of an accident happening at that time next slide please you saw that so many accidents are occurring on account of human error so i thought i'll just see what are that what do you mean by a human error and where did they start from so you know it can be a mistake that a person committed which if you go into it it could be either the reason could be either that the fellow did not know what is to be done or he thought that he knew what is to be done so these are the two different things for a mistake to happen which can prevented by you know training people better giving better instructions and most importantly simplify the job which doesn't require so many interest you know instructions to do the job every time that we do you will try to max simplify the job to the extent possible so that you people don't have to be trained a lot and people don't have to be very to be given very complicated instructions next thing is uh, non compliance no no sorry uh, non compliance uh, the person doing the job knew what is to be done but decided not to follow this is something where we are regularly uh, guilty ourselves that we don't let's say keep ourselves to a speed limits written uh, in a traffic sign what are the reasons that we are you do you know that nothing will happen that's why we decide not to follow it this is exactly what happens in a plant also you take a shortcut for a particular activity and then land up in trouble so the prevention again it is some of them the risk perception needs to be changed again through training to telling people maybe sometimes you might require a punishment in this case non compliance will end up a punishment because it ha- there has to be a lesson which has to be taught though it is not very effective uh, uh, world over we have seen that you know punishing one fellow another fellow is not going to become better but still a punishment is warranted and most importantly if you find if you make a way of doing a job very difficult people will find a shortcut so again we come to this point that the job has to be made as simple as possible that you don't have to have complicated instructions to be done for carrying out a job safely another reason for human error could be that there could be a mismatch between the job and the person 
that is either that person is incapable of doing the job it could be uh, a physical ability or a mental ability or educational background but then uh, the problem is uh, you, you may not be having a regular supply of such qualified people all the time so there may be somebody who does not measure up to the requirements which you are you yourself are not able to make out at the beginning that this fellow is incapable again it would be better not changing the person may not always be the right thing one day a person is remaining absent absent and another fellow has to do the job then you are again back to the same problem so it's better that to avoid human error jobs have to be as simplified as possible i have next next slide please now maximum problem come from the last item that we are having that is slips or lapses a person knew what is to be done he intended to do the job correctly he is able to do the job correctly but in the end messed it up i think uh, this probably if you have uh, come across accidents within your own plant this is one thing that you know that the person who's uh, made a mistake or a slip or a lapse is a person who is probably well trained but then for that moment when he is doing the job his attention was elsewhere and the reasons it could be um, it could be a stress and it could be a distraction and this is one of the cases where it's very difficult to control because people can get distracted very fast there could be a non work related issue play uh, bothering him It's extremely difficult for management to look at uh, look at a job and then try to see that the person remains stress free see is yes and done and the what can be done from the organization side is make the job as simple as possible so that even if he makes a small slip the impact of an accident is reduced that's the that's the uh, thing that can be done from the organization point this particular point has been made in a, you know by uh, i think trevor kletz has made this point that you know it's a changing hardware and or software methods into good simpler ones is a good uh, you know feasible feasible way of controlling human error that he has come he says chaos that's the uh, term that he has given change hardware and or software but software means procedures method instructions etc to simpler ones everything to be made simpler so that human error also when it happens doesn't impact the environment as much as it can and have a next slide please can i have the next slide please now all these various types of accidents uh, just see what has happened some of the uh, i think these are all well known to all of you but i thought i'll just uh, summarize chernobyl the nuclear uh, uh, accident which happened somewhere in the 1980s 43 casualties 1 lakh 25000 people died subsequently with 200 billion dollars total money wasted on account of an accident at chernobyl Gopal, nobody knows uh, exactly how many people. Maybe five thousand, maybe ten, eight thousand, uh, because the long-term casualties nobody has kept account. Eight hundred crores Union Carbide paid as damages, but the economic loss of people in Gopal nobody knows because nobody has calculated, and it is ex- it's very very extensive damage has been created in Gopal. So I'm sorry, yeah, well, sorry. Can you go back? can i go back and there have been couple of other big damages which happened in india and you know, there was a fire at vaishak refinery in 1997 with greater than 50 people the uh, casualties mumbai refinery in 1987 about more than 50 people died jaipur oil terminal fire even though number of casualties much lesser the amount of legislative changes in the, in the oil industry not legislative standard changes in the oil industry happened on account of jaipur oil terminal fire you know all over the country uh, refineries and oil installations had to undergo a lot of uh, um, 
modifications to comply with the recommendations of this particular incident which happened in some in 2009 uh, we'll just go through some of the uh, can i have next slide please couple of well known uh, accidents which happened i'm sure there are uh, people in this audience who know this better than me but it is worthwhile going through a couple of them again so that we don't forget and there should not be another bhopal which is happening anywhere in the world forget anywhere in india forget anywhere in the world and bhopal in 1984 when it happened uh, some of the anyone who is younger than 38 if they are there present in this audience were not even born when this happened but people like me i have just started working in 1984 a couple of years into this when this particular incident happened and uh, the first few days of whatever photographs which came in paper uh, horrendous uh, we never knew that working in a chemical plant could be so so much dangerous not only to the people who are working in the plant but also to the general public as such and it had far reaching effects on a whole lot of loss which came in Uh, right from you uh, know uh, the factories act got changed environmental impact assessment procedures subsequently got revised uh, ma uh, maximum accident hazard changes uh, which are there import of hazardous chemicals anywhere and everywhere bhopal had a echo we'll just go to it as to what happened in bhopal so we all know can i have the next slide please we all know that uh, bhopal uh, union carbide Uh, had set up a pesticide factory in bhopal in 1970s to make a chemical by name carbaryl that was the uh, intention of uh, setting up this particular plant at bhopal the pesticide and uh, union carbide on invitation from government of india the you know, government of india wanted a lot of pesticide manufacturing units to come up in india because that was a time when agriculture was go, you know picking up in 1970 the green revolution was very much uh, in the minds of uh, the governments at that time and they wanted pesticides so union carbide had agreed to set up a plant at uh, near bhopal bhopal why because it is in central of india so the but the location that they selected was meant not meant for industry hazardous industry but is into for light industry and commercial use that area was given to bhopal for setting up this uh, chemical plant next slide please. originally the idea was to import a component called methyl methyl isocyanate uh, and manufacture carbaryl but uh, you know they found that this is a very expensive business of importing methyl isocyanate so uh, union carbide decided that uh, they will make the intermediate also in bhopal store it and then convert it into Uh, carbaryl with a subsequent uh, reaction so there are the facility for storing um, methyl isocyanate isocyanate which they themselves were making and then large quantities were being stored at site and then converted into uh, carbaryl but uh, by 1980s middle there was uh, you know general economic downturn and Union Carbide was running this plant at only get 25% capacity, but that did they did not you know say they wanted to sell and get out, but there was nobody to buy. So they were you know thinking of slowly dismantling the plant and taking it somewhere else. Probably as part of that exercise in 1984, there was a refrigeration system meant to store MIC below 11 degrees centigrade for safety reasons. You know, higher temperature means higher pressure of vapors. etc etc so they had a refrigeration system for some reason and it was alleged that it's a cost cutting measure that the refrigerant was removed from this and then uh, discarded so the refrigeration system stopped working in 1984 next slide please uh, just a quick look at their process this thing you see the uh, tank in the middle you can see mic storage tank that mic storage tank there are three of them Now all the MIC produced in the plant is stored in this particular system. There is a refrigeration system, and the safety systems are the three of them which are shown at top and on top. 
there, there is a process control valve which controls the pressure in case the pressure goes a little above the normal it's let out into a vent tower and the vent tower had a scrubbing facility using caustic soda and if the pressure increases very much above the design pressure then it is let off into a flare where it is burned and another one which was uh, which is not shown here is that they had a water spray in case even after all these things doesn't work and the vent is still spewing out poison gas then they had a water uh, spray tower uh, system mm -hmm. whereby they used to spray water on top of the vent and then uh, it, that was supposed to dilute the vapors coming out uh, in uh, 1984 for some reason the mic storage tank lost its ability to maintain nitrogen oh by the way this was kept under nitrogen pressure there's an additional safeguard that was there that uh, the tank was kept under nitrogen pressure it did two things that if there is a pressure of nitrogen uh, it was used to increase the pressure and push out the entire mic through a pump so that the tank can be fully emptied but uh, in 1984 one such tank lost its ability to maintain nitrogen pressure. So, the pumping out business was not happening from the tank and the tank was kept as it is with 40 tons of uh, liquid uh, methyl isocyanate. While this problem was going on, the MIC plant, including the flare, was shut down for maintenance. So, flare is out. Second safety uh, system which they had went out. And the production of carburetor using stored MI started out immediately in the November itself without the flare. The flare had still not come back for some reason. They took a decision not to have a flare, which means that in case of an excess pressure, there was nothing to release uh, the gases safely. They are restarted. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. I'm sorry. Previous, previous. On uh, December 2, 9, on some, for some reason, late evening, some water entered into this tank, which has lost its ability to control nitrogen. There are various reasons which are being talked about as to why water entered, including sabotage, but those are immaterial to us. Uh, we only know that water entered, and water plus MIC is an immediate exothermic reaction. Pressure starts rising immediately. It was noted immediately by the control room people who for some reason assumed that the rise in pressure is because of a faulty instrument. They did not bother to check why the pressure is rising. They just continued over as it is. 11.45 p.m. area, operated, area operators smelt MIC and they reported that there is some MIC which is leaking from somewhere. Next. By the time any action could be taken, the pressure went out of control and emergency venting continued. Now look at the situation which is there. The only thing that was available which was not taken out of service was a vent gas scrubber which used caustic to neutralize but they did not have caustic. It was nothing to neutralize the gas which is coming out. Flare was anyway out of service. Water spray which should have uh, controlled the release by dilution did not work because when they started pumping they found that water did not reach the required height and the refrigeration system was anyway to a deep commission long time back this water spray thing I mean, all is something that we check regularly in any mock drill which is there apparently maybe the system of having a mock drill or checking such things were not in prevalent in 1984 the only reason I can think of as to why they realized it that water doesn't realize, reach that height is that they have not tested it ever. Okay. Now, at night 1 o'clock, about 40 tons of MIC came out and then wind carried it over to Bhopal. The siren they sounded at 12.50 when plant conditions became very bad. It sounded inside the plant, but the one which is meant to alert the general public was kept turned off. Why? Because they did not want to create unnecessary panic. By, you know, in case you turn on a siren, 
due to any reason and the people will you know get panicked that there is a leak so that kept it turned off so people did not know that there is a uh, an emergency inside the plant plant people knew they evacuated downstream and they escaped with a few people remaining for shutting down when the smell started coming out the remaining people at the plant gave a reassuring reply said don't worry nothing is wrong it took 2 hours for ucil to tell the nearby hospital that there is a leak and they rang up the hospital and told there is a leak of mic no doctor in that place had heard of this particular chemical so they did not know how to combat till then they were thinking that there is an ammonia leak and they have been treating people for an ammonia leak and the worst thing that happened is that maximum people who suffered were children who were shot and therefore an mic being heavier than air affected children more than affected adults extremely extremely painful so just having you know let's cutting the story short what all went wrong in bhopal these are some of the major things that i picked up and put first thing first and foremost a decision to manufacture a carbaryl it was it necessary that carbaryl had to be manufactured you know, this thing or wasn't there some other uh, pesticide which is available that there were other pesticides which are available so probably it would have been better to consider less hazardous chemicals than carbaryl starting from there then uh, union carbide decided to use an mic route to pro- produce carbaryl was it there some other way of doing it yes they themselves had another process by which you can make carbaryl without producing mic as an intermediate this is another thing you could have they could have avoided a hazard as an intermediate but they decided to do this because why because they had ready made designs available elsewhere so just copied and put it in then uh, somebody decided to store 100 tons of mic so that you know what they were doing while uh, mic plant is down they can continue uh, production of carbaryl this is something that we all are guilty of storing intermediate products regularly so that our production is never uh, affected but if they did not have so much of inventory they would not have been so much of leak another thing next thing is water entered into mic tank yes it could probably have been a sabotage issue but any person who is doing hazop would have immediately realized that there should not be any connections given on this particular system whereby even by accident water can be entered into or you know, pushed into the system so there was apparently there would have there had not been any system by which prevention of water entering into the mic tank was taken temperature started rising operators uh, did not even bother to look at it there is a need so that operators are not to ignore warnings at least in certain very critical systems refrigeration system out of service protection systems we know that should always be kept in working condition though we are guilty of occasionally bypassing them we have to keep these protection systems in working order how do you how did they you know they fail to control the discharge of mic they had no scrubber no flyer no water curtain nothing again the same system protection systems have to be kept in working condition 8000 people died yeah so you know you we all know that we should control population near major hazards yeah, it's easy for us to say that in a place like kochi i am also staying very close to a um, major accident hazard not very close but reasonably close to major accident hazard and we know how difficult it is yeah but so many people had not stayed next to the plant at gopal maybe there would have been much less of people who died an emergency have not been handled well so, you know, any safety person in this uh, group of the uh, standard procedure is to communicate msds to of the plant you know equip you know, the chemicals that you are handling if there is a chance of it getting out of the factory into the uh, public at large then the uh, hospitals nearby are briefed that such 
chemicals are there and these are the material safety data sheets that are given to the authorities as well as to neighboring a uh, few hospitals who are immediately uh, located close to it in case you used to do it uh, but then there are other com- other companies where i know then the state that i work the data factories used to complain that there are a few uh, companies who are handling apparently hazardous chemicals but they refuse to even tell the chemical name of the chemical what they are handling saying that we cannot tell you because it's a trade secret and we'll only tell you chemical a chemical b and chemical c and then they'll they'll tell you that if it is leaks chemical a leaks we'll tell you chemical a leaks and there is an msds for chemical a but they will not tell the name so something worse than that has happened in nepal that they never even told what it is to anybody and nobody knew how to handle it so on the right hand side you would have seen that i have given some color coding to various actions so immediate technical recommendations in blue color some preventive recommendations in black and some management level action actions you know that training or controlling people near accident hazards or risk related import to public those are all management level actions which are regularly taken care of now even if you don't take care the authorities will force you to uh, declare this in your, in a uh, rapid risk assessment or a quantitative risk assessment data or a document which is sub- submitted to them there are public hearings etc etc so people are much better aware of what's happening in an industrial accident please can i have it? so this is another incident which i thought it is very interesting it did not happen in industry it happened in an aircraft but it has got you look at it as a pressure vessel this is the there's a aircraft by name comet made by a company called de havilland they created they manufactured this first ever jet airliner by name comet so it was a big hit to those days that propeller aircrafts are gone and jet has come in jet aircrafts are because they are flying at a much higher altitude are having pressurized cabins so it's as good as a pressure vessel a flying pressure vessel so this particular aircraft at be belonging to boac today's british airways uh, crashed soon after taking off from dum dum calcutta and they killed around 45 people or something on board and it had taken off during an exceptionally severe storm so they the court of inquiry which was conducted in calcutta uh, attributed it to the exceptionally severe storm and the pilot had taken very uh, drastic measures to uh, reduce uh, you know this uh, to uh, save the aircraft from effects of the storm so the stresses were high so they did not do any much failure analysis they uh, sort of speculated that this could be the reason why it happened and they did not go into it any further say that thunderstorm created this and it crashed one year later another comet same again belonging to boac took off from rome and crashed into the sea nearby and kill again killed all people again around 45 people a wreckage you they could not take it easily because it had gone down into the sea so court of inquiry proceeded without benefit of wreckage they next slide please they suspected many things but then they considered that uh, fire must have happened within the flight so therefore it crashed without any particular evidence this is how they concluded but it's possible that they also did not have uh, no had this things of boac's operation would be impacted the moment it became known that there is a problem with the aircraft and de havilland was a british aerospace firm so british government probably was not too interested in going into it too much though they recovered the wreckage in time uh, the court of inquiry uh, just decide you know check the balance aircraft did not find any problem and they restarted within one month one more comet crashed this time uh, to the mediterranean sea 100% again around 45 people killed, killed but this, this, after the third incident uh, people decided that this is too much and uh, much better uh, analysis has to go into it next slide please 
So what they found was this de Havilland comet had square windows. So anybody who has flown an aircraft these days would have noticed that the windows provided in an aircraft are all having rounded corners. No aircraft has got square corners, but de Havilland comet those days had square uh, windows. And the square windows had cracks originating from the square corners. They actually tested a aircraft within a facility and they found that it burst open when it is pressurized. A few number of cycles continuous pressurization, it just burst open. But just the next slide, please. Next slide, please. You can see the photo of this particular aircraft. This is the last of the aircraft which was there. You can see all the windows are square in shape. And today, no engineer designing a pressure vessel will use square openings. If you have, it will be either a elliptical or it will be a circle or if you have to provide something like this, the corners will be rounded. Those days probably it was not so well known. Terms like stress concentration in 1954 was not so well known. So square corners had to be eliminated as a design change. Another thing is that better inspection practices to check such points for cracks. Even after all this in 1990, there was another aircraft which crashed for the same reason. This time from a crack originating from the door. Though it was not a uh, square door, but still there was another crack originating from it, which could have been prevented with better inspection factors, ultrasonic examinations are done on aircrafts regularly, which they have missed this particular time. Right. We'll go to the next one. Next slide, please. We'll come back to this particular challenger space shuttle if they get time. Otherwise, I'll go to the uh, can I can I skip a couple of slides, please? We'll leave this Challenger Space Shuttle and go to yeah. Yeah. Or we just went through uh, uh, two big accidents which happened, very high profile accidents which happened. Now, what are the ways by which you learn from accidents? There are, you know, you must have by now. Most of you would have been very extremely familiar with the failure analysis techniques which are there. But I'll just, I thought I'll go through this. Uh, simplest among them is uh, something called five eyes. You have a failure that you see, uh, let's say, a crack notice. When you start asking repeatedly the question, why? Why did the crack uh, happen? Why did it happen in this location? Why at this time? It is generally found that about after about five times questioning of why on a particular issue, you should be having a reasonable guess as to where the problem lies. So that's why this particular technique is called five whys. But then it has to be done by a person who has got deep knowledge of the system which is under uh, examination. That the person who is asking the questions should ask the right five why questions so that you end up with the correct answer. Another way of uh, uncovering a reason for an accident is, a, is called a fishbone diagram. Again, you must have seen this particular thing, those who have not seen. Uh, if particular effect you take, the effect could be blast. So you write down the multiple causes which, are, which can create this particular effect. In a, put them in a graphical format. Graphical format, you know, if you draw a straight line and if you put all those things as slanting lines, the causes as slanting lines and the effect as a single line, it looks like a fish with all its bones. That's why it's called a fish bone diagram. One of the other way of, you know, from an effect, find out the causes. Now, a fault tree analysis is another way. It's a different technique that you have a fault, a failure which happened, let's say if a bearing failed, it could be due to 20 different reasons. 
you will go into each of those 20 reasons to find out which is the one which uh, contributed to failure of this particular bearing. So, you know, from uh, effect, now it has come to a failure. You can have a cause and effect analysis. You combine a fault tree and five Ys, then you can have a cost and cause and effect analysis. You can have a failure mode effects analysis, that is a what if analysis and then fault tree analysis together. Or you can have a barrier analysis. Barrier analysis is that suppose you have uh, created protection barriers so that a fault which is happening in one corner doesn't travel across. But still it traveled across, so now you have to work out and see which is the barrier which failed. It's called a barrier analysis. Or you can have a Pareto chart. You are definitely aware of Pareto chart. 80% of all problems are created by 20% of things. So you take out these uh, small items and have a regular analysis of the small items. Small number, high uh, impact items to find out which one created. Next one please. Now that we have a you know, general idea of uh, incidents, chemical plants carry the maximum risk of widespread societal damage, large accidents, etc. Et so the practices followed at ICI. Now ICI was the largest chemical plants in the 1940s and 1950s in the whole world. So the principles of safety developed in ICI have gone into a long way in making chemical plants safer, specifically the effect of a person by name, Trevor Kleck was a chemical engineer, then he became ICI's technical safety director in the 60s. He has worked extensively. One of the things uh, which uh, developed in uh, ICI at that time was you know, the well-known uh, procedure of hazard, which you use keywords to find out hazards. You, most of you may have gone through a sort of practice at some point in time or other. So I don't have to go into it. I just pointed it out. Next slide, please. Now let's come to the nature of an accident process. Most accidents follow a three-step process. That is an initiation. That's the event that triggers. There is a propagation and a termination. So as a safety engineer, I'm sure all of you must be uh, working towards ensuring that the initiating events do not happen. If it is initiated, then at least you try to prevent the propagation. Or if they are propagating, at least we should be able to terminate it as quickly as possible. So one of the these three, if you do it fast, then the effects of an incident doesn't carry across to a much larger society in general. But what you should understand is that there is an implied that avoidance or elimination of initiating events may not always be feasible. That there is whatever you do, you may not be able to eliminate or avoid all of the initiating events all the time. There will be one or two which get through, which have to be stopped at the propagation stage or if not at the termination stage. Right, next slide, please. Uh, the standard methods, what do we do? You get an, uh, uh, an impact of an accident, then you start putting in layers of protection from the accident source to the general public, different layers so that the effect of the accident by the time it reaches the uh, general public is minimized to the extent that is feasible. Uh, this is okay in uh, most cases, especially when the risk is not perceived to be catastrophic, so you can have uh, such protections. I'll just go through in the next slide. You know, the layers of protection analysis of a typical process plan which is built according to certain general guidelines, basic designs. The basic design itself is the first layer of uh, protection that is available that you follow some, follow some fundamental good principles in design. Then to that extent, the chances of accidents are low. 
next level that you do is that you have a set of written procedures and instructions to operate the plant and then train people in operating the plant the second level of protection that you are having then you have you have a certain level of engineering standards and basic control systems which work over and above all these things and then keep the plant in a safe controlled condition the next layer of protection is that in case these don't work properly then you have got you have systems whereby alarms are sounded and there are human interventions possible to take a safe shutdown if those don't work then you have got safety instrumented functions which come in automatically and shut down the plant even if the next thing that safety instrumented functions don't work then you have got physical protection systems built in like you have a relief system where you let out all the gases into a flare system or you can have big dikes across storage tank that even there is a rupture taking place everything is contained within the tank after all this also if a physical protection itself fails then you look at protection to the general public from this particular failure if it is feasible you provide that also and sitting right on top of stuff like emergency control systems community community level responses etc etc whereby you may have to evacuate people or save people etc so there are some eight or nine layers of protection that you can think of in a chemical process plant but if you look at it really it is not necessary that these principles have to be applied only to chemical process design you can look at a construction of this thing and still see that same names can be given even in a construction site that if you follow all these systems you may not be having protection required for public but you can at least prevent accidents with these layers of protection given to practically any situation in a working atmosphere you can you can some of them don't require so much of effort to previous like this previous like this some of them don't require so much of effort to put in layers of protection so therefore it is not worth it you can have two or three of them and that be done with it so you can see that the first two items are fundamental in nature they don't uh, come into play only when there is trouble they are present all the time those are passive basic designs and written procedures are there present all the time they give a sort of passive protection over it but control systems critical alarms instrumented functions physical relief and all active systems they come in only when there is a need for this protection system to act and reactive system the last two items you know if uh, failure has happened and then you have to give a protection or uh, emergency control systems are reactive in nature basically the first two items are the ones which are you know needed for us that this should not create any trouble either the passive system should act or an active system should act next slide please uh, i just described this so we will uh, we'll not go into how to calculate the layers of protection uh, sir uh, will you be distributing this uh, slides to the participants jay kumar sir or my safety counsel somebody can Oh, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. Because you know, then I can skip a few slides. People who are interested in can go through it and then. Uh, okay. Yeah. Next slide, please. Now, passive versus active control. Uh, I have just described that. Problem with active controls that at times even the best possible control systems also fail. sometimes you know you have got unforeseen causes but then it is possible that a control system after all is a control system there is a possibility of an error which happens one day or other maybe very very minute minuscule uh, possibility but that the minuscule possibility can happen one day so therefore you cannot all the time be you know, be happy that i have got a very solid active control look at the type of 
uh, controls which Bhopal had to prevent MIC from getting out from the tank. They had built in four control system. On the face of it, it looks like very well protected. But over a period of time, one by one, all four got removed. When the time came, there was nothing. They had the refrigeration system which was removed as a matter of policy decision. Uh, they took out another policy decision to remove the player from the service and continue operation. Uh, caustic was not available. God only knows why. Caustic was not available for a scrubbing. And the water curtain system didn't work because water didn't reach that height. So, on an engineering basis, they had four levels of active control in Bhopal and all four different. So, it can happen to us also. For some reason or other, it may not be due to negligence, it may happen one day that whatever active controls that we are having may not work. So, our endeavor should be that we should not depend on active controls only to protect us. Why at all create a situation where there is a hazard and then create controls for controlling the hazard? That is where in process safety, these concepts of inherently safer design have come in. This has started about 25-30 years back, I think this. In the 1990s, people started talking about inherently safer designs. By the, of course, most of our plants have been built much before inherently safer design practices came. But at least uh, the procedures that we are generating now, we can relook at them and say whether they are actually inherently safer or not. Just can we go to the next slide? Please? Just after doing all these things of design systems, why is it that you know there are residual hazards which create trouble for us? So it could be various reasons. It could be that people did not know at that time, or people were known but their consequences were not fully analyzed, so they didn't provide mitigation measures, or Hazards and control were known, but mitigation processes were incorrectly provided. Or mitigation measures were provided, but they were incorrectly implemented or did not follow. Or it could be implemented as per original intention, but failed to act. This is what happened in Bhopal. All of the above were implemented, but they were not there to protect when the time came. All of them were in place and all worked as per the intention, but the consequence of the residual risk was still so huge that it created trouble. I mean, this is a theoretical instance. I do not know of any actual situation where happened where such things work and still the risk was too. Can I go to the next slide, please? So, in inherently safer design, what is it that people are trying to? Uh, very simple things which uh, people have defined that what you don't have won't, doesn't leak. First thing that if you don't have MIC in your plant, it won't leak. Or in Flixborough's case, in Flixborough they were manufacturing, uh, I think, uh, caprolactam. Flixborough was a plant in the uh, UK. There was a blast because of leak of uh, cyclohexane from this particular plant, and the cyclohexane exploded. It killed some 27 people and flattened that entire island. This was a small island where this plant was situated. That entire island, all the houses got damaged. And 27 people died. So, Flixborough, there was no need for them to go through the cyclohexane route to have. To uh, manufacture caprolactam, there could have been some other route. Instead of that, they uh, took this extremely dangerous chemical called cyclohexane, which leaked and created a problem. Second, in Bhopal also, no need for them to go through the MIC route. There are safer ways to make carburant. So they did. They went through the MIC route and created it. Second point, what people are saying is. People who are not present can't be hurt. Now, this is a bit, you know, why do we allow so much of population near a hazardous chemical area 
but as i said in kerala if you are coming to kochi and then make this making the statement very difficult but the people who are there or not present can't be heard is a fact that you know you in terms of general thing what do you uh, what do you categorize victims as first party second party first party is the people who are working inside the plant second party are people who are connected with the plant your suppliers or visitors etc who come into the plant knowing that there is a risk they are the second party third party third party are the innocent bystanders they are the people who are you know staying in uh, houses outside the plant area who may not even be aware that there is a big risk sitting next to them and there could even be a fourth party that is a generation which has not yet been born very rarely such incidents happen so normally we should be worried about first party second party and third party and third party in any case cannot be hurt so that is you know they are innocent bystanders therefore they should not be subjected to unnecessary risks third point of you know inherently safer design is complicated systems give more opportunities of failure this is something that we all know that the more complicated things that you make the more trouble that you are inviting in causal somebody will find a way to do things differently if the system is complicated okay next slide please if you apply these principles into actual practice then what are the steps that we can take to make things safer right at the beginning of conceptualizing or designing a system first thing is do we need to build things so big can we not reduce the size is a question that can be asked in fact i know in my working this thing i have actually seen a, a particular uh, plant in the high it's happened in my old company in vizag refinery uh, they had a system whereby there used to be very tall columns containing uh, amines amines were used to absorb hydrogen sulfide created during the process in the refinery so there used to be huge quantities of amines carrying this uh, uh, no, hydrogen sulfide dissolved in them and a leak from there can have a potentially extremely damaging accident because the amount of uh, material coming out could be very huge but then vizag refinery worked on it and then reduced the size of the process plant to 110% or something like that extremely small so it is possible that you can actually intensify that's the word that has been used intensification or size minimization intensify means you know you actually reduce the uh, sizes or quantities per unit whatever that you want to measure so you don't keep so much quantities of uh, materials can we work with much smaller amount can we work with much more everything points to amount of hazardous chemicals which are available within a plant you minimize it to be extent that is possible next slide substitute all very simple bhopal you choose a less dangerous process uh, we'll come to the other bhopal we know we have used, there were other process available to make carbaryl so instead of that you know they went on a particular route less hazardous hazardous route is always better challenger and uh, we'll come to it if you get time otherwise you know just remember that the space shuttle uh, had an accident and the rocket was built in two pieces uh, and sealed with a gasket why can't they have gone for some other design so i'll come to it if you get time and this particular refinery seven people died because of a leak from a carbon steel plant when it was well known that such processes you should use chromium steel they should have substituted carbon steel with chromium steel and that's practically standard in the world now that in such services only chromium steels are used 
but uh, such, such substitutions could have saved lives. Or you use uh, less flammable, less toxic, less reactive agents as solvents or for heat transfer, etc., etc. Basically, try to reduce the risk in terms of uh, reactivity of a particular system which is available. Then you moderate the operating conditions that you try and work with lower temperature, try and work with uh, lower pressure, you know, use catalysts which are which can be working at lower temperatures to transport the material in a non-hazardous state, you know, like uh, you know, uh, refrigerate instead of pressurization you know, or, you know, basically try to reduce the uh, operating conditions to a safer level rather than continuing with that in case there's a leak, you're finished type of things that you should reduce and then come to moderate levels, whereby the impact of a leak is much less. Next. After all this also, there is a possible that there will be some amount of process fluid which escapes into the environment. If that so happens, at least you can limit the amount of energy available to process fluids. You know, uh, process fluid, flammable process fluid escaping into the environment at low temperature is a less likely to catch fire than which is, comes out to near ignition temperatures. Self-ignition temperature, something like that. It's always so, therefore, uh, try to reduce the energy available to a process fluid as fast as possible in the process system or another one you it's something that is uh, known well known to all of us today though 40 years back uh, there were no such systems existed that don't drain light hydrocarbons into open sewers and when i started my career uh, we used to have channels whereby you know where you choose to carry oil whereas today no one will ever do that it's all drain into closed systems directly into a closed system, through a closed pipe into a closed system. Or you can have a good system by whereby you don't reduce, reduce the number of samples that you are drawing for testing. Your process conditions should be so set that there is no need for you to draw a sample every now and then to check whether things are made as per your specifications or not. Process conditions should take care of that, that if it is set at a particular system, it should run at that system and should reduce and uh, therefore your number of samples drawn just for the sake of testing it should be avoided. You can't avoid certain samples like certification samples can't be avoided because that is needed. But uh, testing samples should be avoided as much as possible. And use good maintenance practices to reduce extent plant shutdown, etc. You don't uh, you know, necessarily shut down just for the sake of carrying out maintenance. To the extent possible, the time taken between two maintenance uh, intervals uh, should be as much as possible. Most refineries, that you know, of late are aiming at trying to work once in four years. That don't shut down for four years. If they aim, they are not successful, but that's at least they are working on such principles. Next slide, please. Simplify. You don't have to create operating procedures or safety systems if the right operating conditions are anyway followed in the first place. You know, incorporate passive arrangements to avoid electric safety devices. Or, though we are very much in favor of having instrumented safety controls, instrumented safety controls themselves are liable for failure, or at least they increase your uh, work by needing to test them very often to see that they will work at the time when they are needed to function. Instead of that, change the design, avoid instrumented safety controls to the extent that is possible. Uh, simplify 
the systems to the extent that is possible. That's the another step that is uh, talked about in inherently safer design. Yeah. Next slide, please. Eliminate. I don't have to say this. Remove or modify hazardous activity from hazardous storage design. These two things, I'll just take two minutes to explain what happened at uh, Wiseat and what happened at Jaipur. In Wiseat, they had a system, they were unloading LPG from a ship into a sphere. The ship to a sphere, that's about, I think, 10 or 11 kilometer line. I don't remember exactly, but it's a long line. And after each empty, they used to fill it up with water and keep it. And LPG used to push out water and then displace the water. And that uh, once the water is entirely displaced, it's rooted to the sphere. Now, this activity it so happened that they could not control LPG coming out of the water draining facility in very short time lpg came out through the drain pipe of water the water after the water the gas also came out created a vapor cloud and then it blasted killing uh, 50 odd people 60 people the bad previous slide please that's what's happened at uh, wiseat and in uh, jaipur while they were segregating uh, a line, a pipeline, they had a system called a hammer blind and hammer blind you can actually isolate and drain by a particular system but that hammer blind failed and the isolation failed and petrol came out into the tank farm, it caught fire and then you know 11 people killed and 300 people injured. The fire uh, I think went on for nine days I think. So it was a very, very bad uh, incident which happened. So after Jaipur, this particular equipment called a hammer blind have been removed from all the oil installations in the country. It, I think, went on for several years. That's so many. And they introduced a new type of system whereby a block and bleed a system, double block and a bleed system has been introduced all over the country, all refineries and all oil terminals had to change it. So they had removed this particular hazardous activity by way of a new design. Yeah, no, it's an aftermath of Jaipur. Next slide, please. Segregate. Physical separation between hazardous and receptors. People stay next to a plant. Please remove them and put them uh, far away or at least take the plant and put them far away from people. It's easier said than done. One, I mean, I'm talking about a society at large, but between plants within the factory, there are certain minimum distances which are you know off later. People are extremely stringent about uh, providing minimum distances between different hazards. That the distance between plants are kept as much as possible so that you know. An accident which is taking place from one facility does not spread to next one. Next please. So just as a summary to it, you know, uh, in summary, from an inherent, uh, inherently safer design, what are the things that can be taken care? You can minimize or you can substitute or you can moderate or you can limit the effects or simplify, eliminate and segregate. One of these seven items taken place, you know, were taken with due attention has been given at the beginning. Would remove a lot of your headaches at the subsequent time. You can still continue doing with all, you still have to do hazards. You still have to do provide layers of protection in between, between the uh, hazard source and the general public. After all that, but then your effort will be much lower if you start thinking about these things at the beginning of the stage of the project itself or an activity itself. Next slide, please. Um, if you apply these safe you know, principles through a system life cycle, then 
at conceptual stage what is it that such decisions are to be taken it can be which product to make which route should be made this is what you know gopal could should have done at the beginning it said that you know do you want to make carbaryl or something else where will the plant be located etc etc those things are actually taken care in our own laws which are uh, prevalent in the country that any major accident as you know we all know have to go through an environmental impact assessment and at the minimum a rapid risk assessment has to be given if not a quantified quantified uh, you know so quantifiable uh, quantified risk analysis or qra or a rapid risk sometimes rri if it's a very large project then uh, some of these points are addressed at that time it inherently designs this thing that which product to make the authorities can take a decision that you know this product seems to be a very dangerous one so let's deny the uh, permission to be given to setting up of these things which is what we keep hearing daily on whether we need to have that particular development project or this particular development project in kerala daily some uh, argument is taking place in the media on this particular item whether inherently whether the project that is being talked about is safer or not next slide next slide please if you are going through a detailed design then there are a whole lot of things which can be taken care of in a chemical plant uh, i don't have to go through all these things you can gaskets drains injection points in my opinion these are the three uh, areas in a chemical plant which create which are the source of maximum uh, trouble to a to a chemical process plant that there are sample points or drains or there are gaskets which are not correctly provided or injection points whereby you are injecting a foreign material or something into a process site which usually creates some corrosion or some disturbance to the process at that location so therefore injection points should be given special attention uh, good operating principles yes keep always uh, lowest possible inventory we don't have to sell this you know even any finance guy will tell you don't keep inventory sell and convert it into cash it works out in safety also cash is safer than inventory then uh, yeah as a good operating principle we all know provide a work to permit yes isolate train make gas free any equipment is standard operating procedure for any chemical operating plant next slide please yeah do it uh, next slide please and don't lose focus on high severity hazards that if you concentrate on 20% of the has 20% of the items which are high risk you can contain 80% of the trouble next slide please just uh, as a conclusion a good safety program conducts regular reviews and removes hazardous situation next slide please an excellent safety program does not allow the hazardous there is a difference between a good safety program and an excellent safety program and an excellent safety program does not allow hazardous situation to come into place in first place itself we should not allow as a situation to arise um, i think uh, i am on time though i had to skip a bit fast maybe uh, i could have uh, spent more time on certain items but i had to finish it after one and a half hours a subject which is very vast i had to skip through most of the items but hopefully since it is a revisit is understood that most of you know the boss subject already very well we just brushing up certain items which are there i would be glad to uh, answer any queries that you may be having i really uh, flow to thank you sir for the wonderful presentation thank you sir.
and you have taken us uh, destinations uh, decades away from the present and starting from the analysis done by the ILO and start the flight incident at 1953 from Calcutta. And there yeah. I was explained so many incidents that is Opal gas tragedy and the Flixborough incident. And in detail, we have learned the root cause of the uh, Opal gas tragedy is very learning for us. And you have mentioned that around 2% uh, of action has been contributed by the our country, India. It is very <laughs> painful uh, news for us. Yes. And human error is the main contributing factor for an accident. And to overcome that, you should say you suggest that that is that some changes in the hardware and software items. And uh, there are so many uh, points you have uh, mentioned in this, that is the minimize what are the uh, layer of protection systems and the analysis and how can you reduce the incidents that is minimize, substitute, uh, moderate, limit effects and simplify, eliminate segregate it is an eye opener for the all the working person in a chemical industry and uh, we are also thankful to you sir for spending so much time uh, for us it is uh, grateful for all of the person working in chemical industry field is a type for the any question answers you can place your uh, questions in the chat box anybody can answer a uh, question place the questions That is a wonderful thing that uh, you have mentioned that is the flight is a flying pressure vessel. That is a very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it is a flight pressure. In fact, I, I also did not know until I read mm -hmm. about this incident mm -hmm. that yeah, we should consider a flight as a pressure vessel. Mm -hmm. Though it's not operating at very high pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still outside, outside pressure is hardly anything and inside it's one atmosphere. Okay, sir. Okay. Yeah. And uh, FA series are also having the capital lactam plan using the same process that is using the cyclohexane. I know. That's I didn't it. want to say that. <laughs> I didn't okay, want sir. to say that. But mm -hmm. uh, the difference probably is that they had six reactors and you don't have six reactors here. Oh, okay, okay. Sir, you are, in, uh, you are from uh, FACT, right? Ah, here also six reactors, sir. sir. Here also here six, 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 in, six in series, is it? Yeah, yeah. Same, same, same dicto, sir. That is the same process. Oh, I see. This is started I, I in 1990. Yeah, 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 yeah. My classmates you. were there in uh, your plant. <laughs> okay, sir. Okay, so, thank you. Is there any questions? Is anybody can? <coughs> no, this is chat post. There is any question. Uh, so I officially invite Mr. Dennis Savior, Senior Manager, TPM and Safety. Uh, Carbonata University Limited to deliver the official water thanks. Denise, here, please. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening to all. Sir, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah audible. Yeah. Uh, good evening to all. Uh, thanks for giving me an opportunity for uh, delivering water thanks in this webinar series. First of all, uh, let me heartfully thank respected Vinay Kumar, sir, Retired Director Technical from Mangalore Refinery and Petrochemicals Limited. Dear sir, your lecture was excellent, knowledge packed and eye opening for all of us. Thank you very much, sir. I thank Sri Ajay Kumar, sir, retired AGM FACT Kochi for his excellent felicitation. He has spent his time and energy for the 51st National Safety Week celebration. He was very active in organizing competitions. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I thank Shri Nayar Nandakumar, sir, Associate Vice President, Carborundam Universal Limited, who played a vital role in organizing this excellent webinar series. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I also thank all concerned in organizing this program. Also, I thank the participants. Your part participation keep us going. Thank you very much uh, for all of you for your active participation. Tomorrow, our webinar series is at 7.30 p.m. by an eminent personnel 
Mr. Vinod Kumar on road safety. He expecting all of all to see you in tomorrow's tomorrow's webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Denis Xavier. Uh, thank you so much, sir, Vinay Kumar, sir, for spending you. so much time with thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you. And Nudavma, sir, can we wind up thank the program? You. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Jay Kumar, sir. Uh, okay. We can close the program. Okay. Thanks to Vinay Kumar, thank you. sir. Thank you, Jay Kumar, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Concluding, we are winding up the session.